Quite some time ago, I developed some thoughts for a message, I preached them, and put the message away. But I honestly believe that I ought to sound some cautions as I go from place to place, along with others, that God would have us bring to the people. And so the message that I had nearly forgotten seemed to afford me a vehicle for expression of these cautions. I therefore would like for you to go with me to the book of Revelation, chapter 12, and I want to read something there. Before we do, maybe it's significant to point out that when God sent the great prophecies of Daniel in the Revelation, at both times the world was under the leadership of pagan powers that were unspeakably cruel unscrupulously evil. And so God did not choose to speak frankly and clearly to his people. Rather, he couched his will and his word in symbols. And God made the symbols clear to his own people. I think it is so today that only the people of God can really understand what God has to say. For spiritual things are spiritually discerned. An understanding of what God wants us to do is dependent upon our own humility and our teachableness, our childlike spirit. Not upon how sharp our intellects are. God has come up with a saving faith that is good for the professor and the ignoramus at the same time. The just shall live by faith. And I have been greatly intrigued in my study of the symbols and listening to other ministers explain them. The book of Revelation is full of them, and chapter 12, incidentally, is a composite history of the church, or prophecy and history of the church, from the time it was organized down to the coming of Christ and beyond, when the church is settled in glory. It's all in chapter 12. And we've studied the symbols. There appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman, we know that the woman represents the church, clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet. We've been told many times what that means. Upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pained to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And then I find a symbol that was very intriguing, and frankly, I found no explanation for. Verse 4, And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. His tail. He used his tail to pervert the very stars of heaven and cause millions of them to be cast down. His tail. What in the world did that mean? All the other symbols clearly explained in all our tracts and literature, but he used his tail. My subject is entitled, Heads or Tails. And there are some cues as far as I am concerned as to what all of this might possibly mean. I read a very familiar text. Adventists love to read this one. It's found in Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 13. And the Lord shall make thee, the Lord shall make thee, the Lord shall make thee, the head and not the tail, 
and thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath, if that thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them. Now we've got an explanation of the head. God will make thee the head if we hearken. That means we listen, that we give attention to him. That we hear his voice above all other voices and march to his beat, though other drummers are drumming. If we will obey his commandments and do them, the Bible says we will be the head. Now there are many other things that people think will cause them to be the head. Some look to antiquity of doctrine. Some look to great riches and even great paintings and works of art. Others look to the powerful choir or the great organist or uh, the multiplicity of members and so forth. God disallows all of this. He said, I will make you the head and not the tail if you're willing to obey the truth. That ought to be encouraging to us. Ladies and gentlemen, Christian friends, God reckons us to be the head when we obey. He does not judge us according to how big we are. He never chose Israel because they were many. God judges us according to the pureness or the purity of our hearts and our willingness to submit our wills, to yield our wills to him and to obey what he has commanded. And whenever a church or a people are willing to do that, God says, you are the head. doesn't matter where you worship. When the first church was organized in the upper room, they didn't even have a building. And many other churches were organized in living rooms and in the homes of the people in various places. It is better to worship the Lord in truth under a tree than to worship the devil in a cathedral. You are the head and not the tail if you believe God's word. And if you're willing to obey God's word, he said, it is then that I make you. Now, your works don't make you the head. God says, when you show me that attitude, that spirit, that willingness, then I, through righteousness by faith, will make you the head and not the tail. And you will be above and not beneath. Now, there's one more text that I think sheds a little light on this that I have mentioned, and I will turn to it in the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, in verse 15. And I want you to listen to these words. It says, The ancient and the honorable, he is the head, and the prophet that teacheth lies, he is the tail. Those who are willing to obey God's commandment and teach and preach and live the truth are the head. And the prophet that teacheth lies is the tale, the Bible says. Now we've got some light on this symbolic prophecy, Revelation chapter 12. He used his tail. He used lies and deceptions and false truths and innuendo and insinuations and all other kinds of insidious, cunning remarks and ideas in order to pervert and subvert so that he literally ruined a third part of the stars of God and planted suspicions in the minds of even more. There were questions in the minds of others in the universe until Jesus died on Calvary and settled those questions forever. The devil was successful with his tale, his lies, his deceptions. And I want to borrow that figure as we go on through our message tonight. The devil started out with his tale. You know, we fear the sword. But the sword has never been as effective as the tail, the lies, the deceptions. That's how he got us started wrong in the first place. God planted Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and God made his will clear to them. And he said to them, in effect, as long as you obey me, you'll be the head and not the tail. And along came the devil. And he got Eve away from her husband, and the Bible says he spoke to her, Yea, hath not. Let's stop with yea. I was curious as to know why he would begin a sentence with yea. And I looked it up and I found out it's a light greeting. It's like saying hi. He attracted her attention in a most pleasant manner. Hello there. Why? I haven't seen you around here before. Hi. And then he said, hath not God said you shouldn't eat? 
Now, you pardon me if I make this as clear as I'm capable of making it. The devil always makes you think that God is hard and that he requires more than he does. Some people seem to have a burden to make everything wrong. I don't have any burden to make everything wrong. But bless your heart, if God says it's wrong, I have a burden to make it wrong. Has not God said you shouldn't eat of these trees around here? And Eve was quick to come running to God's defense. Like a lot of us, she was glad she knew the truth and glad for the opportunity of straightening the devil out. No, she said, God didn't say that. All God said was, there's one tree, and we shouldn't eat of that. And the day we eat thereof, we shall surely die. Oh, said the devil, I see. Well, now let me tell you something. That one tree which God prohibits is the one you ought to try. You haven't lived until you try that one. The devil's line. Always wanting us to feel that God's holding back something good. Let me say to you tonight, and I base it on the unquestionable authority of God's word and the spirit of prophecy, nothing worth having in life is given up when one decides to serve the Lord. We talk about making sacrifices. Sacrificing what? When God asks that we give up cigarettes, what are we sacrificing except death and needless experience? and stained fingers and teeth, foul breath and cancerous lungs. What kind of sacrifice? If it's worth having, God doesn't ask us to give it up. Would you say amen to that? The devil wants you to think that you're giving up a great deal. And you know a lot of Christians act like they are. They walk around with long faces and their chins dragging the ground. Mrs. White says a face like that dishonors God. It makes the truth appear unattractive. And when other folks look at you, they say to themselves, if Adventism treats them like that, I don't want any part of it. Christians are supposed to be happy. I ask you tonight, are you happy? If you are, say amen. Now, if you are, you ought to notify your faces. Religion is not a problem. It's a privilege. Being a Christian is not a bore. It's a blessing. Let's say amen again. Oh, no, Eve said. We may eat of all these trees. Oh, said the devil, that one is the one God's holding back. Let me tell you, if you just try that one, you're going to become somebody special, like God, knowing good and evil. And Eve ate and then ran off to her husband, and he ate, and uh, then came God. Ladies and gentlemen, always and inevitably, along comes God. Every time we do something, we ought to think about it. One day along will come God, and every man shall give account of himself unto God. And when God spoke to them, they were ashamed, and they were sort of tongue-tied. You see, the devil was talking up a blue streak as long as he was getting them into trouble. But when they could have used a little help explaining, he was nowhere around. My daddy used to say, son, the devil will get you into trouble and then run off and laugh at you. And that's the way he did. And he perverted our first parents not with a sword. He didn't force them to do anything but with his tail, his deceptions, his lie. He shall not surely die. He used his tail. And if you follow the history uh, of God's people down through the Old Testament, you will discover that the devil never raised up the sword against them. Surely they went to war, and many fell in battle, but this was the chastisement of God, the retributive judgment of God, because they disbelieved. The devil always was too successful with his tail to even bother with a sword. And finally along comes Jesus and the great confrontation. Down here, the devil met him and tried to use that same weapon on Christ. When he saw that he could not, utterly defeated. You know, there's a text in here that says, the same chapter, that base chapter, it says that the dragon fought and prevailed not. That's a wonderful text. It means he fought and he didn't win. And he never has won. Never. And when we join Jesus, we're on a winning team. The devil tried to subvert the Lord and pervert his faith, but he could not with his deceptions, his cunning. The Lord always could see through him and with a, a, a sharp two-edged sword, 
thrust to the hilt in the devil's philosophy. Christ emerged victorious because he relied on the word. Ladies and gentlemen, we must become men and women of the word. For we are told in the last days, counterfeit things will so closely resemble the genuine. The only way to know the difference is through a knowledge of the word of God and through the power of the Holy Ghost. You'd better know the word for yourself. That's how Christ was delivered, through truth. When the devil came with error, Christ used truth. And finally, the devil, seeing that he could not get Jesus to sin through his deceptions, raised up the sword against him, and our Lord was arrested. And you know what happened to him. Finally, he was nailed to a cross. The devil and his host were there about that cross with all who were working for him. And the devil stirred up the people, and he inspired poets, and he inspired leaders. And they began to chant, he saved others himself, he cannot save. If thou be Jesus, if, 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 trying again to cause Christ to release his hold on truth on the fact that he was the Son of God. If thou be Jesus, Son of the Father, save thyself, come down from the cross. But Christ would not come down, and when finally his Father turned his back... And Jesus screamed in passion and yielded up the ghost. The devil clapped his hand. I've got him. But we'd better make him secure. So he locked Christ in a tomb and he whispered to the Romans that you ought to seal the tomb with Roman mortar. We don't want any shenanigans out of those disciples. And then we'll all stand around that tomb with your God to make sure that he's kept past the third day, past the boundary of the truth he has spoken. If we can get him past that, we don't have to worry about him. And so they did this march, but on Sunday morning, God sent an angel from glory riding down through space with the inconceivable velocity of, of light, and he came into the garden. And the devil's host fled, and the guards fell as dead men. And the angel rolled away the stone and cried into the mouth of the darkened tomb, Jesus, thou son of God, your father called you. And Christ got up and folded his grave's clothes, which means he was through with them. He had gained the victory over death and hell. And he walked out with the contempt of the victor and he said, O oh, grave, where is thy victory? O oh, death, where is thy sting? He had won the victory not only for himself but for all men and women who would trust in him. But then Christ said to his disciples, Go ye into all the world. And Christ said to his disciples, As I told you before, I'm building my church upon this rock myself. The church will be as sure as I am. And the gates of hell, Hades, the grave, shall not prevail against it. And the disciples began to go out to preach the truth of Christ, and the devil now cast out of heaven with his power broken. The devil found out the issue settled in the universe. As angels and unfallen beings watched the devil mercilessly torture the Savior. As they saw that demonstration of love on Calvary, the issue was settled for them. And the devil now realizing that his own death knell has been wrung, and knowing that he hath but a short time, and knowing that the disciples go forth armed with truth, fresh from the lips of the Savior, decide to pick, he decides to pick up a sword to try to blot out the church before it can gain a foothold. And really, for the first time, the devil began to try to kill off the church. Now, he was still trying to make the word of God a lie. Jesus had said, the gates of hell shall not prevail. The devil said to himself, I'm going to see. And immediately he set out to blot out the church by killing off God's people. James's head was chopped off. Peter was crucified upside down. Paul's head was chopped off by Nero. And tradition says Andrew and Bartholomew were slain in India. One by one, the disciples were put to death. John was placed in a pot of boiling oil, and when he survived that, he was sentenced to life imprisonment on the Isle of Patmos. And I imagine John must have felt quite lonely out there, knowing that his brethren were dead and that he was the lone survivor, and the church needed him, and he was locked away on an island. 
He must have thought I'm the only one left to carry on the work. He must have thought, what will the church do without me? He was sentenced to hard labor every day of his life. But there was one day John didn't work for anybody. And so tradition says he found a cave on the backside of the Isle of Patmos to keep the Sabbath. And John was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And when he saw Jesus, Christ settled something for John. He said, John, you think you're the last? You think the success of the church depends on you? Let me tell you, John, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I am he that was dead and, and am alive forevermore. The work that I sent you to do does not depend upon you or anyone else, but upon me. As long as I live, the church will go on and will ultimately triumph. But they tried to kill off the church. Finally, there came a period of history that we all know about when the devil put forth supernatural effort to try to blot it out. And saints died by the multiplied thousands for their faith. And just as suddenly as the church of Smyrna emerged in persecution, the period ended with the legions of Constantine riding across the empire declaring amnesty for the Christians. And a few years later, he joined the church himself. What was going on? Gibbon, the historian, explains it. He said, the devil tried to stamp out the church, but every time he killed one, ten joined. And ladies and gentlemen, that's why God allowed the persecution of his people in those days, that he might be glorified, that the truth might go everywhere. You see, the pagans feared death more than anything. And they gathered in the arenas to watch Christians die, to cheer and applaud. But they saw something they thought they never could see. They saw men and women going to their deaths with serenity on their faces, in tranquility. They heard songs and psalms and prayers of praise rising above the crackle of the fire and the roar of the lion. And they went away affected and they were never the same again. And they thought to themselves, what makes these people die like this? And when they investigated, they found truth. And every time they killed one, ten would join. So the devil realized he'd better put the sword down. He was driving more people into the camp of the saints than he was getting rid of. So he laid down the sword, and a few years later, the emperor joined the church. Now, they have an old axiom, if you can't lick them, join them. And that's exactly what Satan did. When I got married... I had been a college student out of school just a little while, and practically everything I owned was in a great big trunk. And I never shall forget when I left my room to move into my home with my new wife, uh, I had everything in that trunk practically that I owned. I had books in it. I had clothes in it. I even had some food in it. And when I moved in with my bride, I took my trunk. And that's basically what the devil did when he joined the church. He brought his trunk, and in it, his books full of his philosophy, his foods, his clothes, he brought the whole thing. And he was smooth-talking again. The sword had been laid aside. He would use effectively his best weapon, his tale, his deceptions, his lies. And it wasn't long... Before he had things going his way, he introduced all kinds of heresy, all kinds of paganism. And as he introduced it, it was swallowed, hook, line, and sinker, and baptized and made Christian, so to speak. And the devil must have smiled with a smile of satisfaction. He had brought in Sunday worship. He had brought in infant baptism. He had brought in all kinds of pagan festivals and Christianized them. And as he gained authority in the church, then he reached down and picked up his sword and he said, Now whoever does not go along is a heretic, and heretics ought to be put to death. And we entered the period of the Dark Ages, and ladies and gentlemen, during that period, 50 millions of Christians were put to death by the sword in unspeakably horrible manners. And I have no time to go into those as we survey history and the devil's effective use of his tail. He backed it up with a sword, but the tail, the deceptions, preceded the work of the sword. 
and the devil perverted the church and Christians who wanted to hold on to truth were literally forced to the outside. They became the underground church, worshiping God in caves, in catacombs, wherever they could find refuge, refusing to yield up their faith. And finally, after many had tried and had been put down by the devil's sword, there emerged the intrepid Augustinian monk by the name of Martin Luther, himself deceived and seeking the peace that only Jesus can give. And one day, it is said, climbing Pilate's staircase in Rome, a voice spoke to him, and it was like the voice of thunder, and it said in the words of St. Paul, the just shall live by faith alone. And Luther got up and brushed himself off, and his tormented mind was turned to the libraries of the church in Germany to study the truth, and as he studied, it was all amplified and made clear that men are saved not by works, not by inflicting penalties upon themselves or paying penance, but by faith in what Christ has already done. And when Luther discovered these things, they literally set his soul on fire, and he set them down until he had 95. And on All Saints' Day, he nailed them to the church door at Wittenberg, and it was underway. Luther debated here and there, fell into disfavor with his church, and finally, after the diet at Worms, was excommunicated from the church and became subject to papal anathema. And the announcement was made that anyone giving him succor or solace would also be excommunicated and subject to papal anathema. And as Luther walked out of that judgment hall, he was kidnapped by Duke Frederick of Saxony and locked away in a palace somewhere in the woods, thinking that his own life would be taken soon. But as he stayed there and realized that God was on his side, Luther sat down one day to write, and he wrote a powerful hymn, A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. He wrote something else, too. He took the Bible that was written in Latin so that the common people could not read it, and he put it back into the language of the common man. You know, God works on time. When Luther got the Bible ready, another German had a printing press ready about 50 years before. His name was John Gutenberg. And so the Bible was put on the press, and it was spread everywhere. And as the Bible was spread everywhere, light was spread everywhere. For this is the light of the world. And as the truth was being read again, the dark ages were on their way out. And the devil realized again he was facing defeat, so he laid down his sword, but never surrendered his tail. He got right into the Reformation, and he bound the churches of the Reformed groups with creeds. He would not let them pursue full truth. And finally the announcement came out of glory, Thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. But on time, true to prophecy, they emerged the Advent group, preaching the coming of Christ. And after the prophesied disappointment, the nucleus of faithful, praying, fasting ones, agonizing with the God of heaven, were blessed with the spirit of prophecy, blessed with the final truth for this final age. At the same time this was happening, the devil got some other things going with his tail. The doctrine of evolution started. And along with it, certain prophets emerged. Joseph Smith, Mary Baker Eddy. Every time God moves with the truth, the devil moves with his tail in some counterfeit measure. So that confusion would surround the people of God. And only those who relied totally on the truth would be able to see their way through the darkness and see light at the end of the tunnel. The room the church was established. And as they were willing to obey all that God has said, light came, for the Bible says, where there is no vision, the people perish. The Bible also says to the Lord of the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, there is no light. God could not give the light of prophecy. He could not give the light of the spirit of prophecy until he found a people willing to give honor to the law and to the testimonies. And when he found such, he gave such. And we testify that we've been brought out of darkness and into this marvelous light. 
Prophecy also says that one day the devil will make war with a remnant of God's people who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. He'll make war. He will pick up the sword against us. And all who study these prophecies know it's going to happen. But here is the whole crux of my message tonight. But here is the caution I would like to sound. And I would for the wisdom of Paul and for the tongue of that man to make it clear. For I feel a responsibility to do so. The devil indeed is going to pick up the sword against God from the church. But ladies and gentlemen, before the devil ever does that, before he ever makes that kind of war against us, he is going to use his failure, his deceptions, his lies, his half-truths. And he's going to use them so effectively, even in this church, that the shaking time will be intensified by that kind of thing, and many who now walk with the Lord will walk with him no more succumbing to the devil's tail. There is a text of scripture which says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. Or, to say it another way, the Holy Spirit speaketh clearly. I'm quoting from 1 Timothy 4, you know that, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Now get that. It didn't say people who never joined the church would walk away. It says they would depart from the faith. Why? I quote on. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. His tale. What kind of doctrine could the devil preach amongst Seventh-day Adventists to cause them to depart from the faith? Ladies and gentlemen, I do not believe the devil will be too successful preaching a false Sabbath amongst us. He's not going to get us to depart from the faith on that. He is not going to get us to depart from the faith by telling us it's all right to drink liquor. The devil's too smart for that. He is not going to get us to depart from the faith by telling us it's all right now to break any of God's commandments. He knows that we're not going to fall for that. And the devil is a smart devil. Oh, don't blame him. If I were the devil, I'd want to be a good devil. I'd want to get my job done. And if I were the devil, if there were any people on earth I'd make it hard for, it would be you, sitting out there all smiley and peaceful. Surely. So he's going to use doctrines to pervert some in the faith so that they'll leave. Well, what do you suppose he'll use if he cannot use a false Sabbath or breaking the law or adultery or liquor and so forth? What kind of doctrine could the devil preach amongst us that would cause us to lose, leave the faith? Now, I can't exhaust the subject, but I can think of a few he might use because he's using them. One that he will use is that this church is corrupt and you can't trust it, so you'd better go off somewhere and form something else. I'm not going to belabor that, but I could. He's going to use that, and he is using it. Mrs. White says these splinter groups do the church a service. They help to separate the chaff from the wheat. No, you, you argue with her about that. Another thing he's going to do is to try to convince people who are a little bit agitated. And you know, if we're agitated, other folks are not our problem. We are our own problem. I run into folks now and then who are terribly upset, and I try to convince them that the man you're mad at is not your problem. You're your own problem. Why, don't you know that if somebody spits on you, he's not your problem? The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. No man is your problem. 
We wrestle against principalities and powers, spiritual wickedness in high places. The devil is our enemy, not people. Oh, look, let's calm down in the faith and not be so sensitive. Mrs. White it makes it clear that ultra-sensitive people can't be saved because they're always thinking evil. Every time you look at them, they think you're picking on them. They're folks like that, and that's pitiful. That's a personality problem. Other folks are not your problem. But the devil gets people a little raw and rubbed the wrong way, and while he has them in that state, then he'll try to convince them that you can't trust leadership anymore. That the brethren at the Joe Conference don't know what they're doing, and the folks at the union don't either, and those on the local level are no better off. Even the pastor can't be trusted. Hey, please don't misunderstand me. If I were in my own church, I'd never say this, but I'm not. I'm a visitor out here, and I'm going to say this. And I want you to understand me clearly. One of the purposes of the devil is to make God common and to cause us to lose respect for God's called servants. And I'm not just talking about myself. We need to remember this because the devil's going to use this. If he can cause you to lose confidence in God's ministers, then when you need prayer, their prayers won't help you. When you need a sermon, their sermons won't help you. When you need counsel, their counsel won't help you. And you need God's servants or he wouldn't have them. Let everybody say amen. Don't let Satan get in with that. Even if a rotten apple shows up in the bunch, don't judge the Lord's vineyard by a few sour grapes. God will take care of the rotten preacher if there ever is such a thing. Devil makes God common and causes you to lose respect for his ministers. This, this, this conversational prayer. You know, I like to be clear. I don't want you to misunderstand me. I spend a lot of time with young people. I have knelt with them, and I've heard this conversational prayer that was so beautiful and so touching that, that really I just came away from the prayer inspired. Don't think I'm knocking everything. I'm not. But there are extremes, and what I'm concerned about is balance in our church. Don't go too far to that side or that side. Let's stay down the middle. A girl got up on one of our college campuses to pray, and in a verse flip voice, she said, Hi, God. Angels veil their faces, crying, Holy, holy, holy. Let's not make God a buddy. He's a friend. Boy wrote me at Blue Mountain Academy. He said, Pastor, thanks for all you've done for me. Christ is a cool cat. No. He's not a cat. He is Lord and Savior. Let's say amen. The devil can come in with this and, and in a very subtle manner through mind conditioning. He can wash us out and we'll depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. I've got one more I want to touch on, and this is my real burden. When I was a young preacher... We were too legalistic, and I know it. When I say we, that's relative. I'm talking about the group I knew about. We were too legalistic, and I know it. And I remember when I began to study righteousness by faith, and I'm not as wise as I'd like to be, but according to my understanding, it's the most beautiful thing I've ever studied in my life. It is my favorite thing. Don't you misunderstand me. But at the same time, I began to study that. I saw the pendulum swing from the extreme right to the extreme left. Or maybe I ought to put it the other way. And all of a sudden, we're talking about all you got to do is believe. Now, technically, that's correct, but people are being misled by that. If they could understand that belief has in it the germ of action, we would be saved. Let me demonstrate. Ladies and gentlemen, this auditorium is on fire. Pastor, nobody believed that. How do I know? Nobody said they didn't believe it. How do I know? Because they're still sitting in their seats. Had you believed it, those doors would have been swinging open and you'd be outside. 
Real faith comes from a root in the Greek, which means knowledge. When you really believe, you know. And faith must be based on something. Faith cometh by hearing, Romans 10, 17, and hearing by the word of God. There are people who have faith in trees and in crocodiles and in rivers. You've got to have faith in the right thing, in the word of God. And when we truly believe there is in faith the essence of action, the germ of activity, when a man believes, he does. Would you say amen to that? And to say that all you got to do is believe without making this clear is a dangerous thing, and the devil doesn't care how nice you talk as long as you don't talk the truth. I can read you a text in James chapter 2 which says, Thou believest, but thou doest well. The devils also believe. That's in James 2, 17 and 19. The devil believes. Well, what am I trying to say? I want you to understand clearly that Christ is all that a man needs, and I believe that. We are not saved by works, but by what Christ has done for us, and I believe that. Not by works, lest any man should boast, said Paul. And I believe that. But James, the president of the General Conference, said, Show me your faith without works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. Ladies and gentlemen, the commandments will not save you, but you are not going to be saved breaking them. Let's say amen. Good religion does not begin with a list of do's and don'ts. It begins with Christ, our Savior. And we need a love affair with him, for when we love him, doing his will is a pleasure. But you've got to do his will. There is no salvation in Sabbath keeping, but there's plenty of damnation in Sabbath breaking. All I'm interested in is a balance. And the people who talk this way, many of them that I hear, I think intend this balance. But the comments I get on the outside indicate that a lot of folk are not getting the point. Ladies and gentlemen, as a minister of God who believes the word, I am responsible to sound this warning. Let us never think that this new revivalism precludes obedience. Now, we do not obey in order to be saved. We obey because we are being saved. A grapevine does not bear grapes to prove it's a grapevine. It bears grapes because it is a grapevine. Christians don't do works to prove they're Christians. They do them because they are Christians. And obedience is the fruit of faith. You cannot obey without Christ. Colossians 1, 27, if I've made that clear, my position on righteousness by faith, that I believe Christ is the answer, the only answer, the only way, if I've made that clear, would you say amen? Please don't misunderstand me. It is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And when the Lord decided to initiate a new covenant with Israel, it's way back in the Old Testament first, by the way, you can read it rather clearly and completely in Jeremiah 31, 31. Jesus said, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. Not according to the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. But this is the covenant. I will take my law off stone and write it in their heart. He did not say I will set it aside or do away with it or that it will not be important anymore. He said instead, I will come in and write it on their heart. What's it all about? John 14, 15, if ye love me, keep my commandments, and. Those of you who went to the fifth or sixth grade know that and is a coordinating conjunction, connecting words and phrases of equal rank and importance, so that that which comes after it is as important as that which precedes it. And here Christ begins to speak, and he does not finish by saying, keep my commandments. He gives a condition that is very important. Listen to it. If ye love me, keep my commandments, and. I will pray the Father, he'll send you another comforter, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he shall be with you and in you. And there is the ratifying of the new covenant in every soul. It is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And when he comes into you, he doesn't bring just a lot of sweet, smooth, ethereal philosophy. He brings with him his law, his character. And he writes it on the heart. Now, the heart doesn't mean this thing. 
It means this, as a man thinketh in his heart, you don't think with this, you think with this. As a man thinketh in his heart, said Jesus, he writes his law up here where you think when you are converted, so that you think his thoughts and you think his way. And if somebody tempts you to steal, you don't need to go to a law on stone and read what God wants you to do. When you just think about the proposition, you think thou shalt not steal. Would you say amen to that? If somebody tries to get you to commit adultery, you don't need to call up the preacher and ask his advice. When you just think about it, your thought is, thou shalt not commit adultery. It's written on your mind, ladies and gentlemen, when Christ comes in. Now, he has to come in first. He can't be there until he gets there. Through the presence of the Holy Spirit. And that was my burden unloaded. Oh, when people say all you need to do is believe on Christ, accept that, but understand what is said by implication. What is said implicitly is just as important as what is said explicitly. When they say to you, believe and thou shalt be saved, that's right. But if you believe, you have to believe all, for Christ cannot be separated from his word. And when he comes in, he brings the word, and he writes the law on your heart, so that when you go around just thinking, you just automatically think, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Thou shalt not take his name in vain. When you just get up in the morning and start thinking, you think, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill. When you walk about your duties during the day, just thinking, you think thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not lie and covet. Ladies and gentlemen, you think that way. And then, as the young people said yesterday on stage, doing God's will when your mind thinks that way is a pleasure. It's what you want to do. It's the way you think. I was at a camp meeting out east. It was very hot. And I was walking with a worker who has a reputation for being one of our best literature salesman. And I've only known him a few years, and I've only known him to be that kind of dedicated person. But we got a little close being associated together, and he said to me, Pastor, he said, let's stop by the stand here and get something cool to drink. And I said, all right, and he bought two sodas from the camp meeting stand there. And we stepped aside under a shade to drink them, and he turned his up, and it sort of ran down freely, and he took it down, and he confided in me. He said, Pastor, I used to drink liquor like that. And I was shocked. I said, not you. Yeah, he said, I was an alcoholic. I said, you? You don't even have the marks in your face. And then in a very brief little testimony to God's goodness, he told me how bad he was, how he hoped to die and threatened to take his own life. And finally he decided in his wretchedness he would try to find God. And he began reading the Bible and talking to preachers. And he said it was bad. And one day he ran into some Adventists and he listened to them. And it sort of started a spark of burning. He got up one day and he said, Lord, today I'm not going to drink. So he decided to go down and sit by the river all day long, get away from his buddies, away from people. That way he wouldn't be tempted. He said he went down there and sat down. And in a little while, he saw a man coming. He didn't know him. The man had a fishing pot, a pole and a creel, and he wormed his hook and threw it in the water and sat down and opened up his fishing creel and pulled out a bottle. And the worker said he got drunk again. Now, he was doing it the wrong way. He was trying and trying and trying and failing. So one day, he made a decision. One Sabbath morning, he woke up, he looked back over his track record, he was so ashamed, he said, Lord, there's no need of me trying to wait till I get straightened out. Oh, that's good news and good sense. You don't get straightened out to come to Jesus, you come to Jesus to get straightened out. If we could get straightened out, we wouldn't need Jesus. 
And so he said to the Lord that morning, he said, I'm going to get up and I'm going to church and I'm going to join today, even though I have not got the victory. And so he went to the Adventist church that morning and he listened to the sermon and the Lord was with him. And when the appeal was made, Brother Toom said he got up and went down the aisle and he gave his heart to the Lord. And he said, you know, the members were so nice to me. They took me home, an alcoholic, sitting up in a nice home at a table with linen on it. And he said, I ate dinner with him, and it felt like I was walking on air. And he said, that night after sunset, I started home again. And he said, I had a room in a room in the house. And he said, when I got to the door, I heard the racket inside, and I knew I was in trouble. And when he opened the door, there was his girlfriend and several of his buddies dancing and drinking. And when his girlfriend saw him, he said she ran up to him and she, she said, where have you been? And she pushed her glass to his lips and he said, I wanted it so bad. You know, we might as well be honest about it. We sin because we like to. When you're tempted to sin, don't try to hide it. Jesus reads the heart. Just say to him, Master, the tempest is raging. The pillows are tossing high. And if you don't help me, I'll perish. So he said, he pushed the glass aside and he said to his girlfriend, excuse me a minute. And he ran upstairs to his room and he said he fell out flat on his bed and he cried, Lord, don't let me go back again. He said he stayed up there a while and he got to thinking they're going to think something's funny. So he went back down there. And when he got back down there, some of his buddies came over and said, hey man, have a drink. And they pushed it. And he said he wanted it so bad and he began to be discouraged. After that great experience, he still wanted it. You see, when we become Christians, we are not divine. The Bible says we become partakers of divine nature. We're still human. We still want to do those things. So it bothered him so he said to his buddies, excuse me a minute, and back upstairs he went. And he fell across the bed and he said, Lord, I'm in trouble. Please, please. And he waited a while and he went back down. And that girlfriend by this time was getting a little bit suspicious. And she came up to him and she offered him a drink. And when he wouldn't take it, she said to him, What's wrong with you? Why are you so different? And thinking he could trust her, he sort of whispered, I joined the Adventist church today, and I promised the Lord I was through with liquor. And he said, Past, if ever I heard the laughter of demons, I heard it from her throat. She threw her head back and laughed mockingly. And then she called everybody in the room and she said, Guess what? He joined the Adventist church. Ha, ha, ha. He says he won't drink again. And he said he stood there embarrassed. Why are we embarrassed when we're doing right? I made up my mind if folks aren't embarrassed about going half naked and acting like nuts, I'm not going to be embarrassed about the truth. What do you say out there? But he said he felt that way. And finally, as they were laughing at him, the man who owned the house said, Wait a minute, everybody. And when he had their attention, he said, Young man, is this true? Yes, sir. You joined the Adventist church today? Yes, sir. You decided to give up drinking? Yes, sir. And then the proprietor said to the rest, This party is over. I want you to leave. And they all started out. And when they were all gone, the proprietor, who was not a Christian, walked over to Brother Toombs and put his arm around his shoulder and he said, You know something? I saw you going upstairs and coming down, going back and coming down. He said, And I wondered what your trouble was. But he said, The last time you came down, there was a strange light in your face. Brothers and sisters, that is the grace of God. He will take a no good drunk and hang a light in his face. Righteousness by faith. But Jesus always whispers, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Go and live right. Go and obey. But I'm with you. I'm in you. I will control you. All you got to do is trust, believe. I will accomplish the works of righteousness and give you the credit for it. That's the kind of balance 
We've got to have in our preaching of righteousness by faith, or I am a lost man. If God has at all spoken to us tonight, I invite you to stand and bow your heads and let's talk to him about it. And ladies and gentlemen, I've been given permission to dismiss this service. And after the prayer, we want you to go, but before you do, may I ask you please to do what you're probably doing anyway. Make this week a real prayer experience. And pray for all of us who will be talking to you. For more will be wrought by prayer than by preaching. Our Father, we thank Thee for providing through Jesus a way out of our dilemma and out of our mess. We're grateful that Thou hast made it simple and easy. We're grateful that our first approach is not to get rid of all our sins, but rather to come to Jesus and let him do it. How grateful we are that our loving Savior is willing. Thank you for loving us, and we are unlovely. What are we that thou art mindful of us? And even if we offer ourselves to you, we've given thee an unworthy gift. You've got to take us and clean us up or we're not worth a dime. Lord, very sincerely, we are grateful to thee tonight for shedding your blood, paying our debt, offering us salvation freely. And if we're backslidden, you've said if we would return, you would love us freely and heal our backsliding. What marvelous grace, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. But Lord, we're thankful that you not only are offering pardon, you're offering victory. And we ask for grace to receive it. And faith for all righteousness is by faith. We ask, Lord, that thou wouldst make thy way clear. And help us to know that while we can hide under the shadow of thy wing, we cannot hide there with sin. We've got to surrender it to thee. We've got to be willing to let thee live a victorious life in us. The servant of the Lord says that we're not living a life like yours. We're living your life. Your life becomes ours as you reside within the tenement of the flesh. Oh God, make this clear to thy people. Let us not be deceived as Satan tells soft, smooth, easy things. Now we know that one day, if we're faithful... We're going to become the target of the devil's merciless attack. He will lift up the sword again. Oh God, may we stand through his deceptions. And then we will only have to fear the external. We will be sealed for eternity and we cannot go out. And as he raises the sword and tightens his grip to bring it down, we'll look up. And see that little cloud. We will hail a coming king. Coming to make our enemies our footstools. Coming to gather his people from the north and the south, from the east and the west. Oh, Heavenly Father, we are praying here together tonight. And everybody here wants to be in that blood-washed army that shall be saved. Isn't that so, folk? So, Lord, have mercy upon us, please. And may this group meet somewhere in glory. We beg in Jesus' name, knowing that our only hope is through the merits of Christ. And now as we leave this place, give us, Lord, 
true meditations. As we go to our beds and as we place our heads on our pillows, give us thoughts of thee. And Lord, if I have not told the truth tonight, wash it out of their minds because I don't want to be responsible for anybody. But Lord, I believe it's the truth as surely as I believe that God lives. So impress thy people as we separate. And may we abide under the shadow of the Almighty. May angels guard our sleep. Remember our young people. Remember all who are here. Don't let Satan injure and abuse these wonderful people. Keep us sheltered. In Christ's name, the only name by which we have approached the throne of heaven, we pray thee for your thanksgiving. Amen. You have been listening to another special American Cassette Ministries presentation. This recording has been digitally reprocessed from the original audio cassette in order to make it available on CD. International Copyright, American Cassette Ministries. To order additional CDs or audio cassettes of this or other presentations or for a free catalog, please call toll-free 1-800-233-4450. You may also order from our secure website at www.americancassette.org. There you will discover the largest selection of genuine Adventist preaching available. You can trust it. There is no compromise here. Waiting to serve you, this is American Cassette Ministries, where we've been maintaining the integrity of the Three Angels' messages since 1975. Your testimonies, prayers, and financial support are important to the continuation of this nonprofit ministry. We're helping prepare America and the world to meet Jesus Christ. He's coming soon.